Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in just a second, so you can find a seat. Um, you can sit up here. We've got a couple seats up here. You can sit on the benches. You could stand, like if you really want to, um, but you don't have to. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Allie Katz. I am the program coordinator here at the Writer's House, and I'm very, 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 very excited to welcome you here today for the Cheryl J. Family Fiction Reading, um, which is one of my favorite programs of the year. Every year we bring a fiction writer who's really doing amazing work uh, to campus. Um, and I want to thank Cheryl J. Family for sponsoring this program. Um, this year, our, our headline reader is a our big reader is Waiki Wang, who is teaching this year as the Craven Writer in Residence in the Creative Writing Department. Uh, some of you may be her students, um, and that is wonderful. Uh, first, though, a couple things. We have these beautiful letter presses, broadsides, uh, made at the Robinson Press. They are free, you can get one. Um, we have books for sale, also, chemistry. If you haven't read it yet, you definitely should. Um, and we're very excited that for this year's reading, we have a student opener, Daniel Finkel. And I want to welcome him. He's the editor-in-chief of the Pen Review, which I believe is the longest-running uh, pen literary magazine. And he's been involved since high school, uh, which is He's probably the only person to be involved since high school the whole way through. Uh, he also runs The Lark, uh, which is Penn Reviews podcast where he interviews uh, writers working at Penn, and those have all been really amazing. Um, and he's known here for his intellect, his dedication to our writing community, and his kindness, uh, which I think is really something fantastic. So let's welcome Daniel. Hi, thank you so much. Um, it's like incredible to be here introducing Professor Wang. I'm actually, I'm just gonna be reading um, a short story, an excerpt from it that I wrote in Professor Max Apple's course this semester. So uh, it's called The Wichita Vortex. <sighs> I am walking home. My plan for when I arrive home is simple. After hanging up my coat, I will go to the kitchen and cook spaghetti bolognese with pork and canned mushrooms. When my wife returns from her disaster preparedness class at the Red Cross, I will first kiss her on the cheek and then whisper in her ear that I have made dinner. It is imperative that the meal be cooked before she gets back so, so that she knows she is in my debt. When I step in through the front door, however, I can smell gravy, and I know already that my plan has gone wrong. Walking down the carpeted hallway to the kitchen, I find my wife behind the counter mashing potatoes. Hi, honey, she says. Dinner will be ready soon. She has anticipated me. Despite my best efforts, she has anticipated me. And suddenly, I am aware of all my organs. I can feel the blood pumping through my brain, recycling itself through my kidneys, feeding into my intestines and pancreas. She has triumphed over me again. Why aren't you at your class, honey? I ask through the ache in my mouth. Oh, it was only tsunamis tonight, so I decided to let everyone out early. She is stacking plates now, setting them one by one on the counter with a noise like miniature cannon fire. Can you help me set the table? Dr. Miller should be here any minute. With an effort, I forced the pain in my mouth under control. Dr. Miller's coming? I invited him. My wife gives me a wide-eyed look. Why? Don't you like him? Sure I do. I can call and tell him not to come, she says, and her hand moves to the phone mounted on the wall. She is looking at me now with her head tilted to one side. It's no problem, I say. I'm just trying to be neighborly, she says. I know you are, honey. When we moved here, you said we should have the neighbors over sometimes. It was your idea. There is no use arguing with her. She has outmaneuvered me too thoroughly. I leave the kitchen in silence. 
At dinner, as Dr. Miller tells us about his recent trip to Paris, I focus on the food on my plate. The mashed potatoes have a bitter taste. So do the chicken and the green beans. Nowhere near as big as it looks in the pictures, Dr. Miller is saying. And the whole Louvre smells like those awful egg and cheese sandwiches they sell in the cafeteria. You wouldn't believe the price tags for those things either. You could get one of the paintings for cheaper. You're impossible, says my wife. I'm just saying, says Dr. Miller. The least Paris could do is smell nice. That's all I'm saying. You're one of the least romantic men I've ever met, she says, and they both laugh. I have my suspicions about my wife and Dr. Miller. There's a lack of friction between them. <laughs> when she passes him the mashed potatoes, their fingers brush, and, all, and even now under my observation, they're making steady eye contact. Enough about me anyway, says Dr. Miller. How was your day at work, Gary? He has decided to be expansive tonight. I have no doubt that he is picturing himself right now sitting at our dining room table with an expansive expression on his face. It was fine, I say, nothing to report. You ad men are always saying that, says Dr. Miller. I must have talked with three guys before you, and all they would say when I asked about their work is nothing to report. It's like a code word. You're like the Masons. <laughs> he is being expansive, I think. He should be careful not to overdo it, or he'll end up embarrassing us all. I'm not a Mason, I say. I'm not saying you're a Mason, says Dr. Miller. Although if you asked a Mason if he was a Mason, he'd say he wasn't a Mason, wouldn't he? I'm not a Mason. Back me up here, Helen, says Dr. Miller. Gary's not a Mason, my wife says, not looking at me. How can you be sure, says Dr. Miller? He goes out at night, doesn't he? Just to get some fresh air, I say. For all you know, he could be going to a secret meeting. You should follow him some night. You'll find him bent over a fire bowl with a bunch of robed old men, muttering incantations. Fresh air is important, I say. Next thing you know, he'll be helping Nicolas Cage dig up treasure under the National Monument. I stand up. Excuse me, I say. No doubt they think I'm going to the bathroom. Probably they think that I will bend over the sink, washing my face in hot water, maybe even popping, popping a Tums or two when I'm done. Instead, I go to the foyer, where Dr. Miller's coat hangs on a rack. As I search through its pockets, bursts of conversation filter in from the dining room. Occasionally, I can hear my wife laughing. I've always liked her laugh. It has a short, breathless quality to it that twists off at the end, leaving you wanting more. One day, maybe, I will get it on a tape so that I can play it on a repeating loop in the event that she dies before me. Dr. Miller's wallet is in his left breast pocket. Quickly now, I search through it, take out a $20 bill, and tear it in half. <laughs> then I go to the kitchen, swivel the trash can open, and drop the torn paper inside. Dr. Miller will never even notice that it's missing, but my wife will find it later tonight when she goes to take out the trash. Two weeks ago, when she invited Dr. Miller to have dinner with us on her anniversary, I tore three $10 bills in quick succession and left them in the bedside cabinet for her to find. It is true when Dr. Miller says that I leave the house at night. Sometimes I can be absent for hours. I hope that my wife believes I am residing with another woman on these 4 a.m. excursions. Of all the possibilities, it is the most dignified option. But the truth is that I just walk. I like to move through town with my hands in my pockets and the smell of prairie grass on the wind, reading the lawn signs illuminated in the moonlight. On my way out of the kitchen, I remember that I was supposed to be washing my face, so I go to the sink. Using the faucet is out of the question, of course, since that would al alert them to my location in the house. Instead, I dip my face into a pan of water on the stove. There are still bits of chicken fat floating in it, but the grease feels soothing on my skin. I stay like that for a long time. My face submerged, listening to the dull murmur of conversation running through the house. In bed that night, my wife and I lie a few inches apart, neither of us yet asleep. We have drunken from things lethian and fed on the fullness of death, she whispers. Swineburn, I say. Stetson, you who were with me in the ships at Mylai, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Elliot, I say. 
Divorce is the sign of knowledge in our time. Divorce, divorce. Williams, I say. Which Williams, she asks. <laughs> Tennessee Williams, Marjorie Williams, William Carlos Williams. Just Williams, I say. In my mind, the names make a kind of rhythm. Swinburne, Elliot, Williams. That night, I dream of the Super Bowl. The opening pass, the one-handed catch, the 20-yard dash, roar of the crowd, ref's whistle. In bed beside me, my wife stirs, muttering in her sleep. It sounds something like paddle. Though I cannot prove it, I know she is dreaming of disasters. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I'm gonna steal some 20s, rip them in half, and hide them someplace. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Daniel. So, Waiki Wang is this year's Craven Writer in Residence in the Creative Writing Department here at Penn, uh, which means that students have the opportunity to take classes with her now, or are taking classes, some of you are taking classes with her now, uh, and also next semester, which is really exciting. Uh, she went to Harvard, has a doctorate in public health, which seems useful, um, and an MFA from Boston University. She was named one of the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35, and she's won a ton of other awards, and Chemistry, which was published in 2017 and has already been optioned into a movie, uh, was one of my absolute favorite books last year. Um, it's a novel that seamlessly integrates science in a way that basically no fiction does, um, probably because of that PhD in public health and undergraduate degree in chemistry. Uh, you learn something while you're reading. Um, and it's also a very complex, sort of heart-wrenching love story. Uh, it's a story about friendship. It's a story about a dog a little bit. Um, uh, but what I really, really love on it, it about it is that it's a very rich text about um, about feminism and about identity and about depression, refusal, and inertia um, in a way that you know, says doing nothing is is doing something. Uh, let's welcome Wucky Wang. Thank you. Are these both mine or is this a pitcher? I drink from the pitcher, okay. Um, thank you all for coming. I see some familiar faces. Um, I'm gonna just start reading from the second novel. It's the beginning, um, so no setup necessary. Um, I haven't finished the novel yet. It's not going fabulously, but I thought I would at least show work in progress, um, says my editor. <laughs> Okay, so from where we are, I can see the Golden Gate Bridge, but it is not the Golden Gate Bridge, says our tuk-tuk driver. It is the April Bridge connecting the banks of the Tagus River. The coloring is also not the same. The April Bridge is red and fiery like the heart of the Portuguese. The Golden Gate is international orange. Is orange at the heart of the Americans? The Portuguese driver asks us. The man I am with says not especially. The driver says, orange to me is the color of frivolity, and frivolity seems American. Americans love to tan. You elected an orange president. <laughs> Ronald McDonald wears an orange wig and sells processed food across the world. What brings you two here, he had asked. No, we were not here on our honeymoon, I had said. The tuk-tuk is an electric three-wheel car. Lisbon has hills, and sometimes while climbing them, the car stalls and begun, begins sliding backwards. There is always a point where it seems we will not make it, and then we always do. That is part of the experience, said the hotel receptionist who booked us the tour. <laughs> part of the experience is to never get too comfortable, enjoy the scenery, but always have a sense that all could be lost. The hotel followed a similar logic. The beds are comfortable, but not too comfortable. The toilet works, but not all the time. Still, it is a decent hotel. It has stars, the number of which I forget. Every morning, someone brings us a tray of five croissants. Every morning, I ask this person five croissants for two people. The person shrugs. At most, we eat two. The remaining three I put in my suitcase as souvenirs. In addition to stars, the hotel has a pool. 
The surface is an ideal shade of turquoise. Earlier that day, the man had asked if I wanted to go for a swim, and I said I hadn't bought a suit. More importantly, I didn't know how to swim. Furthermore, I didn't know how to ride a bike or drive a car. The only way I knew how to get from point A to B was to walk or take public transit. If I were stuck in the desert with a fully few Jeep, I would be fucked. The man laughed. You can't be serious, he said. But he already knew this about the Jeep. The chance of hitting another car in the desert is low, the man continued, as he had before. And if you did, you would be saved, unless, of course, you killed the driver. A writer and teacher, the man occasionally had wit. For the past 10 years, he has been teaching at a community college in Amherst. He has been married twice. We met 15 years ago when he was the father of a girl I mentored through a college club. He is still Sam's father, but he and her, he and her mother, Erin, are divorced, and Sam, who's in college herself and ambivalent about her father, stays mostly with Erin. The club had a good cause. It paired Chinese students with children who had been adopted from rural parts of China, mountain children, or children abandoned on farms. The goal was to teach these kids about their heritage and make a lot of dumplings. The word there, I could not reconcile. The act of making dumplings seemed futile. You could make a thousand and not know anything about the Chinese. You could not make any and know a lot. Was Confucius a foodie, Sam had asked. I said, the analytics never say. I like Sam enough to not tell her that despite looking Chinese, a kind of incongruity might soon define her and she might rebel. So maybe the point of making food was to not talk about the obvious. At the hotel, the man said he could teach me how to swim, and I said it was okay. The pool looked better without me in it. The pool was not built for someone like me, but for a model made entirely of legs. Mile-long legs, I said, but in Portugal, I really meant kilometer. I don't think I've ever seen you in a swimsuit, the man said. He had seen me clothed and unclothed, but never in a swimsuit. Pretty ordinary, I replied. So you really don't know how to swim? Without waiting for a response, he pushed me into the pool, and the sound of my screams caused a row of windows to open up above. When they shut, it sounded like a slap. Why was I in Portugal? Why was I in Portugal with him? Why was I with him? I did not mind going into the pool. I was expecting it. The man liked to exert his dominance from time to time, and I liked to let him. When I got out of the pool, a cleaning lady ran over with a towel. He scolded the man for being very shitty. And the man smiled, the lady smiled, and a bird flew by. Overall, I found the Portuguese to be warm and laid back. When the receptionist booked our tuk-tuk, she said it was on the house. And if the tuk-tuk did slide down a hill, the driver would feed us soothing yet knowledgeable tidbits. Look at these wonderful sidewalks. Admire the handmade tiles, feel the breathe in your hair. Then we would crash, and the driver would talk us through the crash. That was fine, I realized. Crash victims do not feel pain until they see panic on the faces of others. If there's no panic, then there is generally no pain. Fifteen years went by quick. In that time, I became a doctor. I used to be arrogant about it, but now it seems like any other job. It's not rocket science, says Reese, a doctor I work with. I think about that and wonder what rocket scientists say. Reese has fine bedside manners. He's sensitive and stays the extra minute when others would not. I look at Reese and I think, here's someone who went into medicine for the right reason and also has time to go to the gym. <laughs> Reese has spectacular arms, shirt cuffs love him. He is handsome in a way that someone who is always tired is handsome and even when tired can say something incredibly smart. We are not exclusive because Reese has a weakness for women he meets at the gym. They go intense for a few weeks until the woman wants something she cannot articulate and breaks his heart. But what can I do, he asked me, while we were draining a cyst the size of a silver dollar. Keep trying, I said. I didn't know how else to comfort him except to lie. Reese, I said, there has got to be one good-looking woman out there who does not know it yet and is waiting for you to find her at the gym. <laughs> Reese nodded. The cyst was stitched up. Last week, when the man called, I saw the number on the phone and almost did not answer. I carried two different phones, a pager, I picked up the pager thinking it was my phone. Two years ago, we ended on not so good terms. Then he married again. Hello, I said emphatically, because I knew the more I feared something, the louder I had to be. The man cut straight to the chase. Portugal? He was getting divorced. Where are you? He asked. By where, he meant a few things. Where was I geographically, maritally, childrenly? 
The man never liked the word relationship, too many syllables. He did not like motorcycle for the same reason. <laughs> syllables, I said. In 15 years, the man has taught me some things about writing. There are rules, but the first rule is to break them. It is, never, it is better to end a sentence with a masculine ending than a feminine one. Instead of saying you have lung cancer, feminine, better to say you have cancer of the lung, masculine. In reality, it makes no difference. <laughs> Another doctor I work with, not Reese, but the anti-Reese, says empathy is repeating the last three words of a sentence and nodding your head. <laughs> <laughs> this line he borrowed from a book that paints doctors as gods, and that is what we are, says the anti-Reese, who takes himself so seriously they promoted him to director. The God image is not one I endorse. It just seems incorrect. Most gods demand human sacrifice, and the oath to do no harm is historically ungodlike. My mother died recently, I said to the man, multiple myeloma, or myeloma of the multiple. <laughs> and the man said he heard. A few months ago, I had coffee with Aaron, and, he held my hand, and she held my hand while I cried and also tried to drink the coffee. Eventually, she put the cup to my mouth and tipped it back, then wiped my mouth with a napkin. After he heard, he thought about sending a card, but chickened out. Chickened out is how he put it. He was a big, fat chicken. He could have called, I said, and what would I have said? What would I, what would I say? I'm sorry, are you okay? Want to meet up? Can I send flowers? I'm a big, fat chicken. I could think of thousands of things this man could have said. True, he replied, and the line went quiet. I considered hanging up, but that seemed dramatic. I had forgotten something about the man. He had a voice that reminded me of eating a piece of Dove milk chocolate and while luxuriating in the chocolate, folding the purple foil wrapper into smaller and smaller triangles. I said, I have never been to Portugal or taken a vacation in years. I'm seeing people, but it's not so serious that I can't go to Portugal. We're going as friends, aren't we? With my current salary, I can pay for all of your expenses and mine. No, no, the man said, 50-50. In college, I saw this man every week. He would drop his daughter off and sit in the corner of the room with a book. He was the only father there. When we spoke, it was about how college was going. He kept asking if anyone fed me. I was a stick, possibly anemic. I said I ate a lot. On muscle day, I could eat plates of them. On burger day, I could eat five. He complimented my metabolism. This old thing, I said, and he looked at me strangely. The man would frequently remind me how lucky I was. When he was in college, no one had laptops or cell phones or group dedicated to socializing adopted children. He himself never thought he would have kids. Aaron wanted kids, but could not have them. When he told me that, he said he shouldn't have. I said, all that aside, it was probably the same old, same old. Do you think I'm old? He finally asked. What? That you keep mentioning the word old seems to imply that you do. You are older, I reply, but not old per se. In college, I said, per se, too much. He would then mutter to himself and shake his head. I would nod, pretending I understood what he had muttered. I would nod more. Someone watching might have thought I was trying to make him swallow a cyanide pill. One day, it rained. The rain was torrential, and I did not have an umbrella. He gave me his and dashed out with Sam under his coat. From behind, he looked like a trench coat ad. I stood under the awning with his umbrella, hoping the ad would replay. A week later, when Aaron and Sam were out, he invited me over. He made me steak and let me watch TV. That he had, that he had cable impressed me. I'm playing my older man card, he said, and cooked the filet mignon to perfection, five minutes on each side, 10 minutes in the oven, a dark pink in the middle. Now I know to be more impressed with the steak, but all night I was glued to the cable box. It was so mindless. The Shining was on, and I'd never seen it. He played another card by telling me the ending before we got there. Thanks, I said. I definitely needed that. <laughs> During the last scene, you told me how Kubrick had changed it, if not elevated it. Frame by frame, he gave me an analysis of Kubrick's genius. That the man wanted to teach me something was a reason he liked having me over. That I was willing to listen was another. You know, Aaron, he said. I didn't yet, but nodded anyway. You know, Aaron, he said. We met a long time ago, and she is done with me. What do you mean done, I asked, still admiring the cable box. I mean, she pities me. Why does she pity you? I think we all thought I would have been more successful by now. I won a lot of awards for promise. The man named the awards he had won, and I had not heard of any of them, but nodded anyway. I said, whoa, and the man said, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the man oscillated from moments of extreme vulnerability to this. You haven't seen The Shining? I can't believe you haven't seen The Shining. 
Where have you been? How have you lived? Replace the shining with a clockwood orange, reservoir dogs, the godfather, spinal tap, postseason two of Seinfeld, the middle 10 years of The Simpsons. That a list of films and shows had not been stapled to my birth certificate seemed to surprise him. The way he wanted to flirt was to insult me and see how I would react. The first time I laughed, the second time I ignored it, the fifth time I said, keep this up and our chances are low. We had not kissed yet, but we were going to. I thought about our impending kiss. It would be unpleasant, but if he asked how it was, I would say good. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I think we can take a couple questions, and then we'll have a reception, and there's wine and snacks. And uh, Waikiki will sign books. Yes, awesome. All right. Shana, do you want to? Okay. So I'm raising my um, So when you're working on this new book, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, when you're working on this new book, do you, oh boy, hi everyone. <laughs> I had it and then, it was gone, but I'm still holding the microphone. Um, <laughs> do you feel like being super successful, really having like kind of a dream first book, I don't know if it's really a dream first book experience, but I'd say probably a pretty good one. Do you think it makes it a little harder? Does it in introduce a challenge in writing a follow-up? I mean, okay. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry everyone. Question about the second book? Yeah. Um, I think in music it's called The Sophomore Slump, right? Um, so the second rendition of anything is, I think, always slower. It takes more time. Um, you kind of have to fill up the well, or you publish a collection and then publish the second book, so then it becomes your third book. Um, but yeah, it is actually really hard because if I ever want to do anything different, um, you know, I'm sort of worried, well, what if readers don't like this? Or like, what if this is not what they want to read? Or, you know, it, you sort of get voices in your head that you didn't have when you're writing your first book. Yeah. Hey, um, so like a lot of chemistry, and it seems like the second book too, being about a doctor is about people yeah. who kind of have both the like creative side as well as the like sort of science or mm -hmm. STEM or like mathy side, which a lot of people are kind of like, the two do not mix at all. Yeah. Um, but like uh, Ali was mentioning that you did both an MFA and like a doctorate in public health. Like how do you think being able to access both of those worlds sort of informs your writing and your practice? Hmm. Um, I think, I, I, I guess I, um, there's actually not so much overlap. I feel that when you end up doing very high level STEM, it gets so specialized that you're not really thinking about the fundamentals or the foundation. Um, so in that way, I don't necessarily think the research aspect has helped me so much. Um, I'm a very different person when I actually sit down and write an academic paper than when I you know, write a novel or a short story. Um, and there's some things that you, you couldn't, you can write in an academic paper that you can't in fiction and vice versa. Um, but I think what being in STEM taught me was a lot of discipline. I mean, it's very painful um, to sort of go into lab every day, um, do the work and realize, you know, six years later it sucks. Um, and that's essentially kind of is the process for a novel. Um, so I thought I had a really good background for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, it, it actually, you know, it's like you have to write every day, but you don't know if it's ever going to pan out effectively. How do you plot your books? Huh. Well, um, 
I think with the plotting, I have a sense of in these 20 pages, I need something to happen. Um, in these five pages, I need something to happen. Um, but I don't necessarily plot so meticulously as this chapter and this chapter and this chapter. Um, but I think I always start with figuring out, okay, so do I want to cover like six months of time for the, this this relationship or um, this family? Do I want to cover three months? How do I divide up that time? Um, and then I can go into backstory if I need to, but I think figuring out the timing is always the hardest part at the beginning. Um, and also, I think the more I plot, the more, you, you know, choices you don't have anymore in a novel, like the routes are closed um, sort of one gate at a time. Um, and it can feel really scary because once you do this event, something else can't happen. You know, like you can't have zombies anymore, that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, so you have an unnamed narrator in yeah. chemistry, and mm -hmm. it seems like maybe this narrator is, might might also be unnamed, but at yeah. least there's an unnamed, um, like the man is unnamed, right. and it's uh, but there also are mm -hmm. names coming up, and I'm just curious, like what do you what do you think having unnamed characters, whether they're narrators or other mm -hmm. people, what what does that allow a writer to do? Like what what becomes possible when you when you avoid naming mm -hmm. naming these these folks, mm -hmm. these characters? I think I'm gonna probably name mostly everyone in this story except for the main narrator. Um, I mean, it depends. It depends on how it goes by the end. Um, I think when I don't name a character, I get so much freedom from what they can do, their personalities. I think when I give them a name, it's just so nailed down. Like I think, oh, this person is definitely um, like Elisa, so I kind of know <laughs> what is going to happen, and then so much, so much kind of background goes into a name, right? Like, why do I give her an American name? Um, what kind of how I would name her? Um, so I've, I, I think I've always had just trouble naming main protagonists. Um, do I give them a really plain name? So sort of like the Jane Eyre aspect of naming. Um, and I guess it, I'm not, not that clever in terms of giving a name that's very significant of this protagonist's journey, so I just end up having to keep the character unnamed. Um, and when I when I write short stories, I think I go into the third person a little bit more easily, um, and that's easier for me to name characters and get into their heads. The novel experience has mostly been fairly personal. Okay, by person, I don't mean autobiographical. I just mean it feels more like a personal median that I can work with. Um, and that's why I think I like to have some ambiguity around about around the narrator. Hey, Professor Wong. Um, I have a question. I dragged my friend along today, um, oh, cool. and he's studying public health at Penn. So oh, I great. know that you have an extensive like science -y background. Um, but the thing about public health is that it's kind of more, there's more of like a personal or like a narrative component in a way. Yeah. Uh, did studying that affect the way that you think about your fiction or just life in general? Uh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, public health is very global. So you're looking at huge populations and trends. And fiction is very personal, so you're looking at the individual. Um, so I didn't actually feel that there was so much overlap there. Um, yeah, I actually don't know how to <laughs> answer that question. Um, I, I do think that going through public health, so it's mostly statistics, um, is pattern recognition, um, identifying patterns pretty quickly, figuring out when um, there's something, you know, worth pursuing or following up on, um, quote unquote, like significant to, to work on. Um, and that aspect has helped me a little bit in fiction. Yeah. Um, sort of playing off that a, a little bit. Uh, so lots of writers have another job that they do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they either they don't care very much about mm -hmm. or they do. Um, and now that you know you're successful, very successful mm -hmm. at writing, does it feel complicated? How does it feel to have this part of your life that'd be really weird to return to? It like to like mm -hmm. okay, I'm gonna pick up that public health hat again and become surgeon. Well, not surgeon general. I don't know, <laughs> like public health official number one or something. Does that? Yeah. Um, well, 
that that only works for writing. Like in terms of picking back up, um, you can only kind of do that as a writer. So if you don't write for 20 years and you can go back to it um, and do that well. I think once you're off the bandwagon for STEM, it's really hard to get back on. So it's kind of the choices really made for me in that regard. Um, because there's just so many people who are on the train already. It's very cr crowded train. <laughs> um, and it, just, it takes a lot of effort to get back on. So they sort of, you know, with, in, in STEM, it's um, one of those things where if you sort of have like five years of unaccountable publication, they kind of think that you died or something. So you sort of need to account for your time in a way that as a novelist, you don't really need to. Um, so to get back on it would be really hard. It would almost be kind of starting over again. Yeah. And do you feel like you miss it at all because it's something oh, that yeah. you really invested yeah. so much into? Yeah, it, it is. I do miss, I do, I miss the, um, so I was very good at kind of, doing the work behind this. Um, you know, some people are very good at like big picture, like giving me ideas, generating the ideas, telling people what to do. Um, I was very good at the mechanics behind every problem. Like if you could give me a problem, I could figure it out. Um, so I do miss that aspect of it. So now I just use that for other means like, you know, the stock market or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions? Oh. Awesome. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, why did you begin your story with a tuk-tuk? Why? Yeah. Oh. It's a very um, specific automobile. It's a very specific. Yeah, so um, I think I liked the idea of setting the story at the beginning at a different, in like an odd place. I don't know why it felt some felt kind of right for me for this um, these two characters. And I just did a little bit of research into Lisbon and just tuk-tuks are everywhere. So I sort of felt that that was a natural vehicle that they would be on. Um, but no, that was actually one question my editor had, like why a tuk-tuk, why not something else? Um, it felt, you know, I kind of wanted it to be specific to that area. Have you been to Lisbon before? Yeah. Lisbon? Oh, I thought it was in Thailand. Oh, no, it was in Lisbon. Yeah. They also have in yeah, 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 yeah. Um, where do you get your like ideas for your stories and books? Are they more like personal experience? Like they're almost like autobiographical or? No, 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 this no. is not autobiographical. <laughs> um, no, 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 um, definitely not. Um, I think I, you know, um, especially with short stories, what happens is I sort of collect things that I've heard or I've read or I've experienced or I just remember, and then that comes and comes together into a story. So um, th there's a story I wrote this summer, um, and it was about two, a couple going to a sushi restaurant, and I, I, I go and eat sushi all the time, but I've never had that experience. Um, but I'm just thinking, how can I combine things that? Um, I know about with tension um, and aspects of, you know, just what I'm aware of with the characters or the people. Um, I get the question of autobiographical fiction a lot. Um, and I think it's, nothing I write is ever autobiographical, um, but a writer is very good at observing. So where you get your ideas for characters is, you know, just people you're around, friends, family, um, and then you just end up kind of creating something from that, or imagination, right? So something happens, and you say, well, what if I took it to the next level, right? Or what if something, what if I, so something went beyond? Um, what if these two people had a conversation? Um, it's always about asking what if, and then adding some aspect that um, makes sense with the story. Um, so I, I would say that, um, you know, in fiction, it's actually better maybe not to write so autobiographical because it doesn't actually read very real. Um, it just it doesn't read like fiction. Um, and I, I do hear this a lot. A lot of my students are saying, "But this is how it actually happened." And I just, as a reader, I don't care about that, right? <laughs> I, I actually care about the story. I care about you know entertainment. I care about being immersed. Um, so for me to know that it actually happened doesn't 
really change my opinion of the story. Um, if anything, I think it sort of makes it seem like the writer's imagination is somehow dampened by their personal life. Um, and I, I would never want to say that of any writer um, because, you know, everybody's imagination is very different. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed the reading. And in, in I liked how um, it seemed like there was a bit of narration, and then there was this kind of little linguistic riff where mm -hmm. you go off and play on the expectation of what happens. And I w was wondering how much that kind of style is what propels your writing more than sort of plot or something? Is, is, yeah. it, is it kind of sort of language and, mm -hmm. and how that ripples? Yeah, it's kind of brick by brick. Um, and you sort of want write one sentence and you write the other one and then you cut the middle stuff so it sounds like the writing's great when <laughs> there's a ton of connective tissue and you just cut it all out. Um, so I do start with, I needed this one sentence of, okay, so they're looking at the Golden Gate Bridge and then it kind of just built from there. I have a loose idea of what's gonna happen later. So this, you know, Sam's probably gonna enter the story, right? Um, and figuring out how these three characters are gonna maybe coexist in the novel will probably be the rest of the novel. It is the rest of the novel. Um, so I know generally the arc and I know where it's gonna end, but I don't really ever know the details until I get there. Um, and some, you know, some sentences don't work and some work. Um, so I'm not a heavy plotter. Um, one of my mentors was a really intense plotter. Um, he had the saying, five events is a short story, 30 events is a novel. And it's just like that number is just in my head. And in, in workshop, he was like, what is event 29? And I thought, I don't know what is event 29. But he had a very rigid way of going about his events. Um, and that really worked for him. Um, but I don't necessarily think it works for every writer. Um, so kind of figuring out what kind of writer you are helps, yeah. So um, you've mentioned that like you're not really like a big plotter when it comes to writing. So yeah, I was wondering, do you really ever know or like decide on the ending of like your stories or your books before you start, or do you just kind of see where it takes you? I think I know the ending halfway through. So when I'm writing a short, I just finished a short story um, because I don't like working on the novel. <laughs> um, so I finished the short story and I knew the ending. I think about seventy five percent. In. I, I just knew that's where it needed to go, but I didn't know the ending at the beginning. Um, I think you should have a sense of where it's going to end and the actual logistics or the mechanics of it would be different, but having a good sense of an ending is helpful for writer, but also it makes the reader feel like there's a plan and a plan is it's nice. Like not, you know, this, not so rigid, but there's a sense that you're in good hands, you're, um, being taken care of, that there's a sense of acknowledgement, the reader's there. Um, so the stories that I don't ever finish are the ones that I can actually never think about an ending. I just don't know how it's gonna end. And if I don't know, then there's no way a reader's gonna know. So um, yeah, so I think the ending is actually really important to have. Um, generally, if I don't know exactly where it ends, I sort of write, write, write until I realize it's becoming bad. And then I just start cutting. Um, and I sort of cut earlier than I always think I'm gonna cut. Um, one of my undergrad teachers, um, she, that, that was one of her techniques. So um, Amy Hempel used to always just write her stories completely out and then just cut a little earlier than she thinks she would stop. And then that became kind of the natural ending for her. Um, it's a technique to use for short stories as well. Any other questions? Awesome, thanks again so much You're for welcome. this.